Welcome to Mayor Brown's International Arbitration Across the Pond podcast. Each episode is designed to provide insight on legal issues and other matters affecting international arbitration in the UK, US and around the world. The podcast is presented by two of Mayor Brown's international arbitration partners, Quadro Sarkodi from the firm's London office and Charles Harris from the firm's Chicago office. You can subscribe to this podcast on all major podcasting platforms, as well as Mayor Brown's YouTube channel. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Listeners, it's great to welcome you to this latest episode of the Across the Pond podcast. Hi, Chucky. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, really good here. So we find ourselves in an eventful time, the impact of the global pandemic, economic uncertainty, technological change and and so on. And against that background, international arbitration remains as important as ever. And as ever, the rules in relation to international arbitration continue to evolve and develop. And the LCIA international arbitration rules have been updated for 2020 and in fact come into force on 1st of October 2020, that is today. And we're extremely fortunate to have the chance to discuss some of these changes and updates with Dr. Jackie Van Herselter. Jackie is a key figure in international arbitration. She has a distinguished career as an academic, as an advocate, as an arbitrator. And now, and for the past six years, she serves as Director General of the LCIA. Jackie, it's fantastic to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much. And so I suppose since you've spent about uh, six years as Director General, and um, it's been about six years since the last update, you are the, the perfect person to oversee the update of these rules. Well, I'm not sure about that. I mean, when I started out, the uh, 2014 rules had just been finished. We were still um, dealing with some of the implementation issues. And I must admit that um, I was not necessarily keen to uh, live through another rules update because it looks reasonably um, innocuous, perhaps from the outset, but there's a lot of work involved in the back office, if you will. Also, I should say that the the type of rules that the LCA has is the kind of rules where you don't need and don't want to change them all the time. So we have a very deliberate policy of not, let's say, every two years do a fresher upper, but we try to have rules which which withstand the um, um, the changes that, that we're living through. Having said that, um there were some changes that users were interested in and then you know there was enough interest and 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 the court felt that it was time to to do a bit of an update and i was obviously very happy to to assist uh fantastic and we, we note that uh they seem some of these updates particularly in what's contained in these latest rules being particularly apt for the time uh, against new working practices and so on and the new normal that we're all experiencing that's right. And we may come back to some of those details in a moment or some of the more specific provisions. But it's quite interesting how we one of the silver linings, let's put it that way, of this horrific time is that we were able to implement some changes that we had not initially contemplated that I don't think we would have well, perhaps even dared to introduce um, uh, a year ago. And the only reason why we were able to do so is that we were about to launch the rules in March 2020 when the pandemic hit us all. And that was obviously not a, a, a very good time to come out with a publicity campaign. Everybody was scrambling to set up remote offices, etc. So a few weeks and months into the lockdown, we realized that we were quickly seeing some changes to our cases and the way cases were handled and our own working in the office and that allowed us and um, encouraged us to make a few changes to you know doing everything electronically etc which we'll come on to in a moment so a silver lining indeed and we notice this isn't it's an update but it certainly isn't a wholesale rewrite uh we note that the lca's briefing note on this referenced a, a light touch was this a deliberate approach and is continuity important? Exactly, exactly. And and that goes back to the point I just mentioned that 
in principle, the rules are such that they should be able to to be applied in slightly changing circumstances anyhow. There is not a need constantly to, to tweak and change. But a light touch update from time to time can't hurt. That was the thinking. Um, so yes, light touch is, is the theme. So indeed, so moving on to look at some of the, the issues and the, the updates more specifically, I'd like to start with uh, Article 1.2 uh, and the composite requests uh, that they now provide for. Um, the first uh, question really for you uh, is, despite the fact that um, we note that the respondents uh, and the arbitration agreements uh, may differ as per the words of 1.2, well, we assume that the LCIA would not envisage a composite request against separate parties and under separate arbitration agreements at the same time. Would it be one or the other? Yeah, I mean, a composite requests, um, it's always good to start at the beginning. So indeed, let's start with Article 1. The first change that people will, will encounter when they go through the uh, rules update is this reference to composite request. And it's something we considered at some length um there was a decision as some of you may know in the english courts um a versus b which um in a way clarified that under the then applicable lcia rules it was not possible to combine multiple cases in one request um but at the same time we need to recognize that in order for separate agreements to be consolidated you genuinely need a decision to consolidate either by the tribunal or by the lci court as the case may be so we were kind of stuck between i don't want to say a rock and a hard place we could understand from the user's perspective that it might be nice to put everything in a single request but at the same time we need to be very mindful of the limits of party autonomy and in the end, what we came up with is this approach which is flexible, but in particular flexible when it comes to the administration. So you can put as a user all your information in a single document, but it then remains to be seen on the basis of the consolidation provisions, whether this will lead to a single arbitration or to multiple arbitrations, and also that means that you will still need to pay separate registration fees that's not because we want to, to make more money out of these cases but be, it's in recognition of the fact that, that the mere fact that you put something in in a single request doesn't make it one case that remains to be seen but at least it avoids having to put in duplicate requests imagine you know it's not a case we we may see on a daily basis but Let's imagine bills of lading, uh, 20 identical bills of lading, uh, where technically you have separate requests. You could now put them in one request and request consolidation from the court or the tribunal and then move on in, once it has been consolidated, a single procedure. I see. So it's essentially an administrative benefit that you're, you're looking to achieve here. Correct, correct. So so as, as far as the format of the composite re request, do you envision that it'll be one document and then the various requests within one document or two separate documents? Or is that kind of kind of up to the to the parties on, on how they do that? Yeah, you, you would certainly be entitled to do it in more than one document. But I think the benefit for parties will be that they're entitled to do it in a single document as long as for each of the distinct underlying agreements all the information that the rules require is provided so you just need to tick that off but you can do it in a single document and you don't need to um yeah just just copy and paste the entire request for each and every of the constituent parts of the um, uh, composite requests but just to be clear, would the when we come to consolidation, and Chucky will talk about that a bit further, further shortly, um, will the approach of the LCIA court be the same, whether it's a consolidation of a um, arbitration which is subject to a composite request or two separate requests? Yes, yes. The courts. The intention is not to change the requirements of Article One per se. Um, we'll come back to to consolidation, and there is now slightly 
wider scope for consolidation that goes in tandem with the change to Article 1, but that is not dictated by the change to Article 1, but by the change to Article 22. So um, it's not a coincidence that we're expanding the consolidation provisions, but the scope for consolidation or the scope for increased consolidation does not follow from Article 1 as such or from Article 2 uh, insofar as it relates to the response. I see. So, so I think that's probably a good segue to talk about Article 22 and specifically Article, Article 22.7 and 22.8. Now, those articles, as I read it, give both the tribunal and the court a lot more authority to consolidate arbitrations brought under the same or compatible arbitration agreements. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the reason for that update? Yes. I mean, it, it's something I must say I felt strongly about personally, not that I, you know, that that was a driver for the change. But having um, I, I started writing about consolidation, I think two decades ago, the LCA rules were not the most um, extreme, if you will, when it came to the scope for consolidation. and that is a policy decision because you are talking about party autonomy ultimately and and that is an enormously important cornerstone of arbitration so from a user's and in particular from a claimant's perspective it may all look very um, practical convenient desirable to be able to combine as many um related um uh, disputes in one arbitration but there's also the interest of the other parties to be considered um, and, and you need to strike a balance. So what we've done on one level is, is I don't want to say superficial, but is just make it all look a bit more um, united by having 22.7 and 22.8 next to each other rather than somewhat hidden in the previous provisions um, of the rules. And there are, there are two situations one is that you're still at the stage where the court can decide or you're in the state where it's the tribunal with the um, uh, approval of the court who can um, uh, can consolidate. But the big change is that you're not anymore restricted to a situation where there's either explicit agreement in writing from everyone at the outset. I mean, and if that existed, we wouldn't be having this whole discussion because typically mm -hmm. that type of clauses are not um, included in agreements. But the, the main thing is, the main issue is that compatible arbitration agreements um, can, um, uh, can be sufficient also when they are not between the same disputing parties, mm -hmm. but when they arise out of the same transaction. So it can be a situation where A and B have an agreement and B and C have an agreement, and it's not limited to the same agreement and the same parties being bound to the same arbitration agreement. So that considerably expands the scope of these uh, of these provisions. And let, let's talk about that, expand, expand the scope a little bit. So the actual language is, it, as you just mentioned, is arising out of the same transaction or series of related transactions. Now, is, yeah. is there any, any plan on any providing any guidance on, on what that means? That, that's a very good question. I mean, we are um, issuing some podcasts ourselves and, and there will be some, some, some write up. The structure of the LCA rules has never been to have, let's say, um, an authoritative commentary or something like that. So I don't anticipate that we'll, we're going to be doing that. Um, we have in the past, for instance, in relation to expedited arbitration and emergency arbitration, trying to provide some guidance in the notes. And we will be updating the notes um, that currently exist, which are going to be consolidated. Actually, there's currently notes for arbitrators, notes for parties. All of that's going to be combined in a single document. Whether we will at this stage be able to give much guidance on this issue, I don't know and I don't really think so because it will be very fact specific. And don't forget, these are also provisions that need to be seen in the context of the law of the seat and potentially the uh, applicable substantive law. 
Um, so it, it's really a matter of contract interpretation. But I do imagine that there will be a lot of interest in this provision and there may be um, you know, court decisions at some point, um, uh, articles, um, and, and we're going to have to see how that develops. Okay. So, so right now, as far as it sounds like what you're saying is at least at this point, it's going to be a case by case decision from the tribunal or, or the, the court who's ever deciding as to whether yes. there are related transactions. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that is, Again, there's there's competing interests of users. Users always crave hard and fast rules. Tell us when the requirements for emergency arbitration have been met. But equally, we need to recognize that every case is specific and we need to look at the circumstances of each case, which are to some extent dictated by the law, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, hard and fast rules don't really exist here. Um, but equally, we don't want this to be interpreted in a completely inconsistent fashion. So if, <clears throat> excuse me, if and when certain themes or trends develop, then either we as LCA or I'm sure the users will, will start talking about what works and what doesn't work. Okay, one more question about consolidation. It's actually, it's actually about running, running matters concurrently as opposed to consolidation. So I, I, see, I see that the rules also allow for it for a the tribunal to run matters concurrently. Are there per, certain situations where you envision that running the matters con concurrently would, would be more appropriate than consolidating them? Or is that also mm -hmm. kind of a case by case decision? It is, and, and this is very much a reflection of the perceived need of users to have an explicit provision in the rules that enables arbitrators to and, and, and parties to to have concurrent arbitrations. These, as I'm sure you know from from your own practice, these these are tricky, tricky things because, you know, you're talking about separate arbitrations and what's the evidentiary value of um, materials presented in one case. What we can do as an institution, say, in our rules, there is a provision which makes it crystal clear that there is no prohibition on concurrent hearings. But whether that will be the solution or whether you need further arrangements, you know, as 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 counsel, I've been involved in cases where you may think that a concurrent hearing is going to resolve everything. And, and in the end, it may make life perhaps even more complicated. Um, and, and the idea, I imagine, is that concurrent hearings are a solution where formal consolidation doesn't work or is not appropriate. So you're talking probably about cases where you wouldn't be likely to be successful to consolidate. So you're talking about really distinct cases where you still want to make sure that you don't go completely out of sync with what is happening in the other case. That may be very attractive, but I would say it's probably very attractive to one side and not necessarily to the other. So. Um, we provide the facilities and how much uptake there's going to be. Let's wait and see. So moving on to the next issue, we mentioned at the, the outset, uh, Jackie, how apt, uh, some of these changes were for the digital age and for technological developments. Uh, we note the express reference to virtual hearings uh, now at Article 19.2, the primacy of electronic communications we see at Article 4.2. Uh, now, that'll reflect very much usual practice and best practice for many of us. Uh, but what, what is it that's prompted the uh, LCIA to uh, address these uh, expressly? Yeah, I mean, we used to have already a provision that referred to video conferencing. And I think we were, in a way, lucky or a bit advanced. Not all rules had a provision like that. But equally, as you, as you say, it was already deemed best practice by many that you could be creative and you could hear one or more witnesses virtually or remotely or do CMCs virtually or remotely or do entire hearings remotely if that's what everybody wanted. But there are definitely situations where some of the parties and or arbitrators may be reluctant and that could be um, informed by the restrictions in some of the involved jurisdictions. So the pandemic led everybody to 
reconstrue how they were organizing themselves, not in the least the courts. That's been an incredibly um, quick development. If you look at what's been happening, at least in England, where the courts have really gone very far in accommodating um, hearings to be held by Skype or whatever kind of means um, worked for the courts and the parties. Um, so you're creating an environment where there's much more willingness to, to be creative and certainly not to argue that the law per se prohibits these arrangements. Now, we need to be mindful that there are still jurisdictions where that is not quite the case and where the courts are still closed and where there might be um, a similarly bit of concern about arbitrations being held remotely. But again, go going back to what I previously, previously said about us providing a platform or at least providing um, tools, we state in these rules that as far as we're concerned, these arrangements are totally permissible. And if there are reasons why it is not possible or permissible, then that is for the arbitrators to, to, to ultimately decide or for the court to decide if it's at the outset. So if somebody cannot be reached virtually, then you, know, you need to do something differently. Or if the law prohibits certain uh, uh, hearings to be conducted um, other than in person, then that could be a reason, a justification for not doing it. But at least it is now made much more explicit that we should all be thinking about. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it was interesting to note um, what, what one of the points you made about uh, the circumstances where it's perhaps difficult or impossible to reach someone electronically. Now, I note that the provision is made uh, for the, the court or the tribunal to then direct uh, other means and methods of communication. So under Articles uh, 4.1 and 4.3. However, um, do we envisage a potential hurdle or difficulty, perhaps where a party is facing a limita imminent limitation period expiry and perhaps only has a physical address uh, for a respondent? In that, in that case, I imagine the LCIA court might need to move pretty quickly to give authorization uh, for alternative method to be used. Is that something that the, the LCIA court thinks it could respond nimbly to? Precisely, and that, that is because of the structure of the LCA court, which uh, communicates already by means of email, uh, Zoom or whatever. So that's not really gonna be a change. It's also not going to be um, detrimental compared to the practice we currently have, because it, it, as it currently stands, you will, in, in, in certain situations, need to contact somebody, um, you know, by means of hard copies, etc. So we, I don't think we're going to be looking at many cases, but there may be cases where somebody will say in this part of the world, it is simply not feasible to contact somebody um, electronically. personally. What I have learned in the last few months, and I, I, I imagine this is a similar experience to, to what you've been um, uh, experiencing, it's the opposite. You know, courier is not providing documentation um, intended for certain jurisdictions. Um, yes, there, there, there are sometimes little hiccups with electronic communications, but paper communications are becoming much more complicated than, than they, they were in the past. And at the same time, we need to recognize that no matter what the rule is, people may sometimes wish to to use the rules to to obstruct. And, and, and that's not something we can necessarily prevent. Um, but on balance, users are helped, we believe, by an explicit confirmation of the default rule that everything can be done electronically. Uh, thank you. Um the other question and uh, point that we note is that it's now um, clear that the electronic version of an award takes precedence over the uh, the hard copy version. Um, again, I, I guess that re reflects um, the common practice and the uh, considerations that you've outlined. Um, can you envisage, uh, again, in particular jurisdictions, difficulties from an enforcement point of view where the local courts and the, and the uh, legal system uh, in the jurisdiction where enforcement is sought, uh, take a view that the uh, physical copy uh, should take precedence rather than the electronic version? 
Absolutely. And I don't necessarily foresee difficulties, but I foresee that this is something that should be the subject of discussion, debate and decision making. Um, maybe a parallel, which is um, not something that everybody seems alert to. But if you look at the provisions in relation to emergency arbitration from the outset in 2014, there's been a reference to the ability for the emergency arbitrator to issue an order or an award. And it is really important that parties and arbitrators have a discussion about what it is that the parties want, why, and then the arbitrator can decide what to do with that request. And enforcement is one of the obvious considerations. If you say to the emerg uh, emergency arbitrator, I need an award because an award will allow me to take certain enforcement measures that an order won't, then you, you know, you have an argument why you want one or the other. And not everybody seems to be clued in enough to, to argue this point in their favor. Similarly, there are jurisdictions in this world where there are fairly um, specific mm, requirements when it comes to the form of an award and, and not just that it has to be on paper, but it has to be countersigned in a particular way or paginated in a certain way. Um, and then it is upon the parties and in particular the party who has an interest in enforcing to explain that and explain the legal basis. And then there will be a decision by either the court or the arbitrators, depending on the stage of the of the procedures so that you get what you're what you're you're going to be needing i see yes that, that makes a lot of sense so that that concludes my comments on uh ele electronic communications uh and and so on chucky was there anything you would like to add so our article 14 i, I want to focus on particularly on article 14.6 uh, which concerns the powers of a tribunal to manage the arbitration proceeding I guess the, the one thing I take from that is it seems like most of the powers that are enumerated here seem like inherent powers that I mean, most arbitrators already had. I mean, I would certainly feel that I would, I would have as, as an arbitrator. But tell me, was, was that the intention to kind of memorialize these powers with Article 14.6? You're absolutely right, Chuck. I mean, this was, this was the debate that some people said, well, you don't need it. We have broad powers and there have been decisions where arbitrators have showed guts and just applied the powers, again, depending on the applicable law, the law of deceit, etc. And they have just done it. But we also heard from users who said, no, we would really benefit from more explicit um, references in the rules to encourage arbitrators to be robust and to issue these decisions, even if we may all agree that in theory there is this inherent power, help us by putting this on paper or on a website and, and give us rules that will allow the arbitrators to be more robust. So it, it, what we've tried to do is, is, is um, not make it an exhaustive list, not to say only mm -hmm. under the following circumstances may you do this or that, but to give a few illustrations that hopefully will mean that people are more empowered to make the requests that they need and and to to, to specify the uh, um, the remedies that they need and for the arbitrators then to say yes i'm, I'm going to order that even if that may not be what the other party um is very keen on but i don't see any procedural obstacles to proceeding in this robust way so so one of the ones I want to focus on is, is actually Article 22.1, which is incorporated into Article 14.6. And and that seems like, from, from what I see, a, a bigger sea change than anything else. And and that is the what we call in the state summary judgment or uh, some summary procedure in order to resolve a case. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and why the LCIA decided decided to move in that direction? Yeah, I mean, you're right that it is probably the most um, um, remarkable illustration. I don't think there's anything intrinsically different about that pr provision and the other provisions in Article 14 in the sense that the inherent powers probably already covered this 
this possibility depending on the applicable law, depending on the parties, depending on the arbitrators. And we have seen arbitrators already de deploy this type of technique. Um, but we felt, based on what users told us, that having this in the rules explicitly was going to be beneficial. And then we said, you know, it, it is certainly not going to hurt. Uh, so, so let's be more explicit about it. So let me let me I, I keep on hearing you say uh, what users told you. So I assume there was some process where you reached out to stakeholders. Maybe maybe we, we should talk a little bit about about that the process. Yeah, it was a very informal process, and and in um, um, as you guys know, the LCA has a lot of these um, Tilney Hall events. Well, lately we've not been having these Tilney Hall events because of the pandemic, but um, for us the, the Tilney Hall events are a very natural way of gathering intel in a very um, informal but constructive way because of the Chatham House rules that apply people tend to be um, honest and, and outspoken about what they want you get all sorts of users there arbitrators party representatives people from law firms people from chambers people from all over the world and we dedicated several sessions to these rules we or the the potential updates to the rules we also had um, a committee including uh, again representatives from the various groups of stakeholders um so it was not just the lca court or or working group of the court but it was not a formal process and it was not a, a process comparable to for instance what ICSID is currently going through where you have state parties um, and, and it's a much more formalized and, and, uh, and also lengthy and much more documented process. But we have been listening very carefully. You know, people also send in uh, emails, uh, questions when we did presentations. And um, in particular, also when people said to us, well, why don't you have this? Because everybody else now has this provision that is in itself not for us a driver to change. I mean, that there it's horses for courses and it could be that we deliberately do not include something or that we do include something that others don't but if users say that they find a particular concept that other institutions now have useful then we take that seriously of course but you know you're based in the states i would imagine that this type of provision is more likely to be taken up by users accustomed to this type of technique. Absolutely. Uh, a, a continental um, uh, lawyer may not necessarily um, end up with a very different outcome, but may approach the case completely different from the outset and not therefore be that interested in this type of remedy. But what we right. try to do, of course, is cater for everybody's wishes. Right. We, we are we always try to try to get cases done early. So yes, yeah, summary, some some type of summary judgment, summary disposition, motion well, dismiss yeah. is definitely yeah. something that, that we that I see a lot just uh sitting in arbitrations. But uh, yes, sorry, but, sorry, but, sorry. um one of the we should not forget that that it is also in systems where traditionally Certainly in courts, you have much longer hearings where you have long trials, where you have the need mm -hmm. potentially for techniques that you may not need in systems where your hearing is only going to be one day to begin with. And there may be less of a need to curb uh, the mechanisms that you'd otherwise have um, have available. I'm not suggesting that, you know, an American arbitration would always have weeks and weeks of hearings, but you're coming mm -hmm. from different starting points. Well, one of one of the things that I think is common, though, and this is something I heard I heard you talk about in, in your podcast in the, in the LCIA podcast, is one of the things we struggle with when we look at kind of this summary disposition and, and arbitrations in the states is that what is the standard? You know, do we use the same standard do we that we use when when we're in court? I think that's generally the default, but I know there was some discussion or there was some thought when you were creating this rule the, about kind of what you set out in as far as language and the standards you set out in the rules. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. The manifestly outside the jurisdiction or manifestly uh, inadmissible or um, the, the, the manifest standard. 
we didn't want to reinvent the wheel and then manifest outside language is is fairly commonly used but again i'd like to use the um, um analogy with with emergency arbitration where um, on the one hand people crave a straightforward uniform easy to understand standard but the reality is that the standard is informed not only by the facts but by the applicable law and that can be the law of deceit or the law of the substance um so what we definitely did not want to do is to build in procedural requirements and say you know it has to be within so many days because before this or so many days after that um but in terms of substantive standard um, yeah, there was discussion, and in the end, the the manifestly outside concept was deemed to be widely used and reasonably uh, familiar uh, for most users, and without imposing too specific um, restrictions. But it will have to be seen within the paradigm of all the other considerations of each and every specific case. So, Jackie, the next subject I'd like to talk about is interim relief. Um, you've mentioned uh, aspects of that already, and we certainly like the plainer language that has been adopted by way of Article 9.13 and reaffirming the availability of court ordered interim relief in the emergency arbitrator context. Now, when we look at this issue, we always um, brings to mind the Gerald Metals and Timmis case. Um, were, were these changes in some sense a response to issues raised in that case? And do you think that uh, under the new rules, the court uh, looking at the same issue might decide things differently? Well, that is the tricky issue, isn't it? Because what, what the LCA can do is to um, uh, tweak, uh, change, alter, its provisions, but ultimately it is for the courts to decide where if it is a case seated in, in England, section 44 is invoked, you know, how far does the court's jurisdiction go vis-a-vis -vis the jurisdiction of the tribunal on the other hand, and it takes two to tango. So I think we're going to remain dependent on how ultimately the courts are going to interpret section 44 against the background of the LCA rules. I personally am content with what we have. I think the wording has been simplified um, somewhat, which is always good. Um, I personally think that it is helpful if, if um, we keep in mind that what we're trying to do is to ensure that what tribunals can do is what is suitable for tribunals to do, whereas the courts are there to do what is intrinsically not suitable for the um, uh, arbitrators to do. So think about ex parte provisions which are not addressed in the LCA rules or in particular third party measures. When third parties are involved, there is no question that the arbitrators can successfully provide for um, uh, interim measures that are intended also to cover third parties. So for those, you always have to go to court. And it's important that we don't, um, I don't want to say fool ourselves, but that we don't pretend that there is a remedy that we can put into the arbitration rules because you intrinsically will need the courts to, um, to, to, to address this situation. But for other matters, um, hopefully these rules will clarify also to the courts that the LCIA can provide measures we can appoint arbitrators in in 9b situations or tribunals that are already in place can take measures overnight and that need not be um longer than what the courts would expect to require in terms of timing that was traditionally one of the reasons why people felt that it might be helpful to be let's say somewhat differential to the courts because they could do things very quickly and what the last six years have definitely demonstrated is also if and when a tribunal is not yet in place, the LCA can get a, a tribunal up and running in no time. So that need not be a consideration for the court to say, we'll keep the matter here and we will issue a decision on the merits because you know we're quicker. No, we can be as quick. 
but ultimately it will be for the courts to identify what, where their jurisdiction ends and, and that of the arbitrators begins. Uh, that's, that's very interesting. So uh, looking at the wording now of, of Article 25.3 and the provision there that a party can apply to the court for measures uh, that the tribunal would have to would have the power to order under 25.1. What I was interested in is could that uh, serve to act as a restriction, i.e. essentially an outside the emergency arbitrator context, uh, limit the availability of interim relief that a party can seek from the court to those which it could seek uh, in equivalent circumstances from a tribunal? Um, I'm afraid I, I can't really do better than what I have tried to explain in the sense that we try to facilitate, but ultimately it is for the courts to say, these are the restrictions which will be fact driven, which will be law driven in the sense that, you know, it need not be English law. It, it, it depends on where the seat of the case is, what the applicable law okay. is. And this is what you can get in the arbitration from these arbitrators in this particular case. And uh, this is what we can do. I see. So ultimately, it's going to be decided by the court. Ultimately, it will have to be decided by the court. Yes. And I suppose an, another issue, and I, I think you know, I know, I know what your answer is going to be um, to this. But uh, there was there's been discussion in relation to the to 2014 rules about a, a potential lacuna in the sense that uh, the party's ability to seek uh, urgent uh, interim relief on an ex parte basis was would be restricted because uh, the the tribunal would need to be notified and obviously that can't be done that can't be communicated without also communicating to the other party does that effectively uh, mean that there's a, a restriction on the ability to uh, to get interim or emergency relief on an ex parte basis well, th there are rules which at least pretend to go further than the LCA rules when it comes to the availability of ex parte measures in arbitration. At the end of the day, also in those cases, when it comes to enforcement, you will need to make sure that you've, I would say, jumped through all the hoops that apply. And um, I'm not excluding anything, but as I said at the outset, I do think that ex parte and third party cases are examples where the courts are likely to be better placed to deal with with that kind of relief. But I wouldn't want to speculate on where precisely the um, uh, the, the tipping point is. Um, I personally also I've done a lot of work as emergency arbitrator myself, and I think we should also be a little bit cautious. People talk a lot, a lot about enforcement of emergency or interim relief. And even though that is extremely important and certainly as a matter of principle, very important in practice, by the time you need to go to court to enforce interim measures, you've probably already lost some of the advantage that you're trying to obtain with your interim measures. And um, I don't want to suggest that it is never happening, and there's certainly case law which demonstrates that it is happening. But in the bulk of the cases where we're talking about interim relief, parties will voluntarily conform to that relief, not in the least, because they still need to move on with the rest of the case. Um, so it's really a matter of looking at each factual matrix to see where you are best placed um, to go first. And, and that's where we're going to undoubtedly see further developments. Uh, thank you very much, Jackie. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you have any suggestions for topics or want to reach Podresar Cody or Charles Harris, you can find them at the Mayor Brown website, mayorbrown.com. Also, to learn more about other Mayor Brown audio programs, please visit mayorbrown.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening.